Hello, Scouted Football fans. Welcome back to the Scouted Football Podcast with me, Joe Donahue. Uh, the 2020-2021 season is coming to a close, or it may have already finished, depending on where you are. But here in the UK, the big news is that the English Premier League clubs will be permitted to have 25% of their stadium capacity back inside grounds for the first time in 2021. Uh, for many clubs, though, this will be the first time that fans have been back to the likes of Ellen Road, Old Trafford, St James's Park, Turf Moor and, and the Villa Parks for around 440 days. So, understandably, it is monumental news for fans of those teams. Uh, with me today, though, I'm delighted to welcome Chris Hamill, Football Daily's Chris Hamill, no less, to the Scouted Football Podcast, making his debut in episode 66. Uh, it would have been perfect had this been the next episode, number 67, considering the, the Lisbon Lions year and, and everything with the European Cup and Celtic. But um, yeah, for, for, the, for those of you who don't know, Chris is a, is a, is a Glasgow Celtic man. Um, he bleeds green and white and, uh, and has been doing a bit of a post-mortem into Celtic season over on his YouTube channel. Um, but enough with the introductions, though. Um, Chris, how are things your end? Yeah, 67 would have been great, but I'll take anything from that era. Anything from the Jockstein era, the heydays. My poor old man, he had to watch Celtic go from the leading side in Europe to, you know, George Os Samaras and co-, and co up front, who, you know, were some of my heroes growing up. But I never understood why he was quite so, his demeanour was quite so cold watching them. But um but yeah, when you hark back to those sort of years, perfectly understandable. Other than that, mate, absolutely delighted to be here. You guys, one of the uh, the finest front cover game in the industry, I would say. <laughs> I mean, more more often than not, I find myself just looking at the front covers, you know, and then I, only after a good like sort of 15, 20 minutes of appreciation do I get to the content. So uh, it's actually nice to to pick the brains of uh, someone behind the behind the scenes. You're making me blush here. We don't usually do the video on this, and I'm telling you, it's you're making me blush and and, and a bit red. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Gianluca Scamacca on on Volume Nine. He's he's a, he's a good looking fella. I think we've said that Ruthless. a few times. Yeah, he's beautiful. Um, but um, on on to you though, in, in terms of the the football daily stuff, the Euro football daily. You know, you you've spoken to the likes of Danny Alves, Thomas Muller, Ian Robin, Puyol, Del Piero, Griezmann, Oblak. You know, the list goes on and on. You know, it it is. It is. It just seems so so idyllic the the, the stuff that you do. But you know, I, I was wondering whether there was stuff behind the scenes, as you just mentioned there, about sort of you know the background that you have to the work that you have to put in. You know, give us sort of an insight in, into what it's like to to do your job. Oh, we're a bunch of chances, mate. Uh, <laughs> a lot of those opportunities, you know, when said uh, in that fashion, yeah, it, it does sound brilliant. Like reeling off names and and some of the interviews were, you know. Um, Carlos Poyol, we got to have sort of beers with him afterwards. Very surreal, but very nice guy. Was learning Eng- English, so um, we're sort of testing that out on us. And, and those sort of encounters stick with you. But you know, Griezmann was sort of a thirty-second one photo opportunity. <laughs> you know, get him to say something for Snapchat. Um, Del Piero, yeah, that was pretty surreal. Del Piero on the beach in Indonesia. That that's definitely in the idyllic category, but. Yeah, a lot of the time when we get access to these people, um, it's it's three minutes here, it's seven minutes there. It never really goes according to plan. But if you can pull it pull it together uh, and get a get a video out of it, then uh, the win is normally in the edit. You know, fleshing it out, making it look slick, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. But um, no, man, we've had some good opportunities of which I'm very grateful for. And I would like to say that you know the majority of footballers that we meet, very nice people as well. Uh, all all levels of the club that is Hmm. yeah I mean well the Scouted Football podcast appearance I'm sure that one's going to be going straight on the LinkedIn um, because you know why why wouldn't it Um, you know it's been it it is one of the the pillars of of football in punditry these days but um, no no in terms of Celtic we were just discussing that a little bit earlier and you know you're you're a Celtic man I I was wondering sort of because to anybody listening here who may be from Scotland or, or from the UK you know they, they might have detected, you know, that you perhaps don't have the same accent as most Celtic fans. But you know, what is what has sort of been the, the background of why you, you've got a Scott Brown poster behind you? We're an international club, mate. You know, it's an international fan bases aren't for some people. You know, people that pick me out on, on the accent thing, I'm like, come on. You don't appreciate how uh, global Celtic are in scope if you're going to if you're going to dig me out for that. But no, um, my family, my dad's parents were both Glaswegian. Uh, a lot of Glaswegian people moved down to Leicester when the docks closed because uh, Leicester, I don't know if you were 
privy to this information, but um, used to take great pride in dressing the nation, you know, 40, 50 years ago. A lot, a lot of hosiery, a lot of sock making, pant making. Um, and I believe, yeah, that is why a lot of uh, jocks made the journey down. My granddad's slightly different. He worked in the Dunlop factory for 25 years, but it was industry. It was hard graft that brought them down. Um, but yeah, both of them had uh, thick Glaswegian accents. Um, not passed on to me, very much have that sort of um, bland Midlands generic accent where you're not quite sure if it's Derby, Nottingham, <laughs> Leicester, because uh, we all kind of meld into one. No real strong characteristics there, um, apart from Birmingham, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's and I've supported Selwick ever since. And, and it's just it stems really from my dad taking me to see games when I, I, I was younger with the diaspora, you know, in Leicester, there was two Celtic fan clubs actually. So we'll sport for choice. Um, and yeah, because just, just North of Leicester is actually is Corby where a lot of Scottish people are people that still have Scottish accents. That's how sort of insular it is. So there's, there's a mini Scotland, not too far from us as well. Um, as well as the eight hour round trip to watch Celtic, you know, <laughs> beat Aberdeen 3-2 um but yeah just and and that kind of made you feel like part of well made me feel like part of a fraternity you know going mm -hmm. to these little little um dive bars in Leicester watching Celtic I actually watched Celtic lose the league on the last day uh, against Motherwell uh, in the new town arms in Leicester shut down now but shout out the new town arms <laughs> um uh, and yeah, f feeling a part of something. And it wasn't hard to fall in love with it when I was growing up because, uh, of course, when I you know, first first started taking football seriously, so to speak, or first had a, you know, displayed a real interest in it, Celtic were, um, uh, you know, under the Martin O'Neill regime. And we got to the UEFA Cup final in 2003 and that sort of solidified mm. my love, love for them, cemented, uh, you know, Henrik Larsson's place in my heart and... Chris Sutton and John Hartson and Stylian Petrov and Bobo Baldi and, <laughs> you know, a li little bit later, Arta Burrick, Nakamura. Um, so, yeah, it's not got the accent, but um, the, the passion still runs deep. The family curse still very prevalent. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it is that fraternity. It's that sense of belonging, isn't it? You know, you're For following sure. following your, your dad's or your granddad's team. And, and it is that is something which I think, you know, will always just be passed down through generations. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that, that really makes football special because, you know, it has that it has that tribalism, but it has that that real familial mm. link, that, that connection. And it always will. Uh, and by the way, that 2003 UEFA Cup shirt, absolutely iconic, by the way. Absolutely gorgeous yeah, and shirt. That, and that side, I um you know stick to this point uh to this day that side i think could still contest for a top six spot in the premier league right now that was an extremely strong 11 and while martin o'neill's tactics might not have aged all that well in his <laughs> general approach to football you know when when they sell it won a game i think the players got two days off after that um bit nigel clough-esque obviously but um yeah maybe that wouldn't have aged so well but what a talented team that was but unfortunately yeah the uh the divergence since then with the premier league has been pretty pretty hard to keep up with support for the scouted football podcast is brought to you by manscaped the best in men's below the waist grooming manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels manscaped is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide join the movement for all your below the waist grooming needs get 20 percent off and free delivery with the code scouted20 at manscaped.com well, anyway, on moving on sort of as a, as a Celtic fan, you know, it's not exactly been, apart from this past year, it's not been a, a bad decade to be supporting Shit, that mate. club. This year? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, we're going to get onto that because, you know, the past is the past. We, we, we want to talk about the present. And of course, with this being the Scouted Football Podcast, the future as well. But, you know, what, just as a, as a very brief post-mortem, you know, what, what, what went wrong this season? Was this always bound to happen? Yeah, I don't want to sound like, captain hindsight here but i wasn't quite as confident as as other celtic fans coming into the season and that stemmed from just our performances against rangers um at the turn of the year particularly the league cup final when we were decimated but fraser forster sort of had the game of his life mm. uh, made seven or eight saves in a game um jeremy fringpong got sent off as well uh we we won one nil i think G christopher julian's goal was offside as well so massive sort of uh were very fortuitous there but it was performances in in the games that mattered that worried me. Um, I remember Callum McGregor playing left wing back in a Champions League qualifier uh, as our best central midfielder. Just key decisions like that costing us in, in big games because his win percentage, Neil Lennon, 
it was fairly ruthless otherwise. But yeah, it, we were slipping in games where we weren't necessarily the overwhelming favourite. Um, and that was becoming habitual. And yeah, I just I just worried that he was a manager that was kind of stuck in the era of when we first employed him and he didn't necessarily come with any fresh ideas, didn't, didn't raise the bar uh, like Brendan Rodgers in that sense. There wasn't that same professionalism. There wasn't that same uh, perfectionism. Um, and yeah, that same... He, he he couldn't plug the gap like Rogers did that that talent gap maybe with innovation mm. and I like him and he's a legend and he's 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 mainly well spoken he used to have a really good eye for talent as well that that first side he put together with Izaguirre, uh, Kiao he put that together on the cheap and it was a really competent side and he got to the last sixteen of the Champions League you know <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I, I think he, his kind of approach just aged out. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. I hope it's Eddie Howe, but uh, we're taking our sweet time over announcing anything <laughs> new. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a case of sort of moving with the times. That was the that was the idea that I think a lot of people from, you know, who, who may not have sort of a very forensic look on Scottish football, that was the view that a lot of people took was that, you know, of course, you know, Neil Lennon's had obviously these glory days, but of course, you know, football is a is a cyclical business and, you know, you do have to, to evolve and, and, you know, there, there does need to be some element of, mm. of evolution, um, even at the biggest clubs like Celtic. Um, and you, you're going to hate me for this, but the, there was a stat that I, that I pulled out and, and it is on the crib sheet, uh, but it was that no team conceded more goals in the 2020-21 Europa League group stage than Celtic, along with Dundalk and Ludogorets uh, with 19. And I think that is kind of one of, I mean, obviously goals conceded is, is of course going to be an indicator of whether you're doing badly or whether you're doing well. But I think the the, the teams that were sort of alongside Celtic there. I mean, obviously the group wasn't easy with Lille and, and, and AC Milan, but mm. you know, it's it's one of those where you think something's wrong here. Structurally, something's up. Yeah, I mean, structurally is a good, a good word for it as well. We were kind of just hitting the transition an awful lot. We were sort of like, okay with the ball, good at getting our talented players on the ball. And then when we were countered, looked like rank amateurs at, at times. Um, the weird thing is, you know, we beat Lille three two. We're probably going to win Liga <laughs> this season. Yeah. Uh, we had forty fifty minute spell against AC Milan where we were comfortably the better side. I want to say in both legs actually, um, but just weren't very decisive in front of goal or just actually in that second leg. Kind of our fitness just caught up with us, um, which is never great. Uh, that's because that's a very basic thing, obviously. Yeah, it wasn't easy watching and it was the two legs against, oh my God, uh, who was it? The Czech team? Uh, Sparta, I want to, mm, is it, I think it, it Sparta? Sparta yeah, I think it was Sparta Prague, yeah. I don't, because there's obviously two teams in Prague, I don't want to get that wrong. Um, yeah, they were very damning uh, and their game plan sort of very clear, just, just set up to counter us and it was alarming how easy it was. And the fact that we couldn't really change things up from the first 4-1 defeat to the to the second uh, was kind of emblematic of of a manager who would kind of run out of ideas or, or, or I think that level was kind of escaping him somewhat. Um, but yeah, poor, because I think the, the squad is much better than the results. Uh, although everyone's contract sort of not coming to an end, but they're approaching the the end of their contract. I think a lot of key players in their final years mm -hmm. simultaneously, which is not great because now we do have to start quite a seismic rebuild, despite the fact some of those might be at the club next year, I guess. But I think the plan is to sell sell the majority of them, or at least that's what the players want, judging by their performances. <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, I mean, speaking of some of those players who are kind of coming to, to the end of their contracts at Celtic, and I mean, it, it I think it speaks to a wider point of squad planning. You know, we mm. we look at, I mean, I don't want to bring him up again, but, you know, Brendan Rodgers and, and, and obviously Leicester do do exceedingly well in terms of squad planning because they essentially, it seems as though they buy players for, for, mm. for those starting 11 spots before the players that they're replacing have already been moved on. Um, and I think that, you know, one of those players who is, who, who will need to be replaced. And, and you, you do question, is he replaceable? Is Christopher Ayer? Because he's mm. been absolutely sensational for, for you for, for, for quite a while now. You know, obviously for anybody who doesn't know, uh, he's the 22-year-old Norwegian international um, who you signed for, for half a million in 2016. Um, 
And, you know, he, uh, looking up here, he's got 172, 173 games for Celtic, at, you know, at the age of 22, as well as 60 games for, for start in Norway and 17 for Kilmarnock as well on loan. You know, that is, that's a lot of football that he's played. And, you know, he, he's been there on merit, hasn't he? Yeah, he's a, he's a strange defender as well because his, his, his sort of key attributes or attributes that might make him appealing to high bidding suitors don't necessarily, um, aren't necessarily his defending capabilities like he is formidable at stepping out with a ball mm. his passing is extremely good his short game extremely competent I think he's our main conduit coming out of defense really um but yeah it's his kind of ability to unnerving ability at six foot five to glide <laughs> past people in the midfield and break lines that way and he's he's I reckon if if I could gather the progressive yards, you know, for for Scottish football, which aren't readily available to me, and I'm definitely not paying for it, <laughs> uh, he he would be up there. Um, his one on one defending, I think, needs improvement. Um, I think I remember reading his tackle completion rate was between like sixty and sixty five percent, which at that level for someone who's you know national team manager has pro- professed that he's he's sort of coasting because or or he's not performing as well as he can do because he's he's finding the SBFL ridiculously easy. Uh, it doesn't s- suggest that he's, he's all that elite in that regard. But yeah, you're going to get someone who's, who's defending is actually great. His area win percentage is, is normally up there. It's normally in the 70%. Um, uh, yeah, so greater, greater that. And trying to think what else uh, I might have missed about him as sort of a mini profile. I, I think he would be very well suited to a possession heavy side who's you know who are tactically sort of fluid if he if he bombs on with a ball the fullback is gonna yeah. you know judiciously just swap out for him maybe not you know maybe not a Newcastle who apparently are going to open the bidding for him <laughs> at 10 million because then he will just be mostly defending right and we won't see <laughs> the things we like about him the, the most um so yeah, it's going to be an interesting one where he goes. I think Newcastle try the cheeky little bit at eight million. I think I think Celtic know that if another team gets involved, that's that's quickly going to become yeah. ten, twelve. But that's a palatable price for me, twelve mil. And um, I think replaceable in terms of his defensive output. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, but getting someone of his skill set with his potential, yeah, is not doable at, at the price we operate at. But I always think with Celtic players now. Three, four years service. If they get into 23, 24 and they get an itchy feet, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, let's just make sure it's a good price for the club. And in that sense, the Kieran Tierney transfer, bit of a game changer because I've always wanted us to be a, a bit more like Porto or Sporting who are like, okay, we're not, we're from a lesser league, but if you want our best player, you can pay us £30 million pounds for him. Um, and that's always been, like Scottish football has always been scoffed at in that regard. Mm. But now, you know, there's, there's a modern history is 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 building up to, uh, and making Scottish football more credible the van dykes the the fraser forsters the um kieran tierney's i think that's becoming more common practice or clubs aren't trying to fucking under undercut us as much so yeah like i said tw- 10 to 12 million I, i'll take it mate i was going to say 8 million and you know to to then go to and play at newcastle uh, it will be him christopher Ayer, and alan st maximan just herring up the pitch by themselves <laughs> at least st maximan would have a teammate then to actually support him when callum wilson's injured but um yeah i, I think there are there are better suited clubs to 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 Ayer's skill set um in in europe and and in the premier league because we know a lot of a lot of players from the SPFL do end up down mm-hmm. uh, south of the border. But I mean, yeah, progressive ball carrying centre back, you know, that undoubtedly his best attribute. I think he's, you know, he's a player that is just, yeah, very, very, I mean, th- those progressive yards, I have seen sort of uh, the data viz where Christopher Ayer has been streets, and I mean streets ahead of every other centre half in, in the Scottish Premiership. So um, in, in that regard, so yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a top, top player. Yeah. Do you know, it reminds me of a little bit, uh, Adam Webster at yes. Brighton. And, you know, if Brighton got, uh, Brighton were prepared to pay £25 million for him when he was at Bristol City, then part of me does think, like, mm. this is a guy with a very similar skill set who I think would adapt to the level, you know, relatively quickly. Maybe we should hold out for a little bit more, but the contract situation's kind of made that untenable. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he could have been a £20 million export for us, but he's not going to be, but... So I've reined it in my expectations. I've reined them in. <laughs> it's good. It's good to 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 speak to somebody who's got these realistic expectations because you know, <laughs> I, I'm not having to pour cold water on these. Yeah, well, we're going to sell him for thirty, and I'm going to yeah. go. 
well, you do realize his contract's up in 2022. Like, you know, yeah. this is decision time, you know. But um, I think that natural pessimism goes hand in hand with being a fan of Scottish football. To oh, of course, yeah. Honest. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, well, I mean, following the Scottish national team, it, it's, a, it's a special form of torture as well, you know. And, <laughs> you know, being a Newcastle fan as well, it, it does have its, um, you know, the, the joy of the Ryan Christie goal in Serbia was kind of very, uh, was, was very strange because I hadn't sort of felt that at club level for, forever. So, uh, yeah. so, yeah, it was, um, yeah, Scottish football does have that way of, of, of humbling you, I think, at some times. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well yeah. um, on to the sort of the next player, the, the next under-23 player at, at Celtic who, who we've, we've, we've earmarked as, as being ripe for discussion is, is David Turnbull, who's 21. He's a mm. midfielder signed from Motherwell. Um, 2.7 million, I believe the fee was, which, you know, for, for a Premier League club or for, for a club in Europe's top five leagues, you know, that's, that's, that's chump change, you know. Um, mm. you, you were talking about how there's going to need to be a bit of surgery on this Celtic squad uh, in, in the coming weeks, months, years, however, you, however long you want to put it. You know, if you were put in charge tomorrow, uh, wishful thinking, of course, um, is, is, is David Turnbull going to be somebody who you're putting at the forefront of that, that rebuild? Yeah, he's the centerpiece. I think it's we got him for a scandalously cheap price. But then again, like that was Motherwell's, I think, biggest sale. And they've got to kind of build in the same fashion of us when it comes to being resistant to letting players go for you know, th- three mil, I think we got him for, 2.7. Um, but he's just come into the side and he's, and he's already outperforming most of the players in every important metric. Um, he's a chance creation machine his shot location's a little bit suspect (laughs) but I think he is the like by far and away the outstanding young talent in Scottish football and I think there's five or six at the minute that could definitely make it at at sort of lower maybe Premier League level high up in the championship Lewis Ferguson at Aberdeen I like Alan Campbell at Motherwell I think he's a little bit unheralded Um, quite a similar skill set to Scott Brown actually uh, in, in that regard he could probably play at a high level. Ryan Porteous gets a bit of grief at Hibs, but his passing from at, from the back is sort of why I think he might be an okay replacement for Christopher Iyer. He's just not, not got that mobility. Um, and who else, are we, who else are we missing? Um, Doig from Doig even. Not a soft G, it's a hard G from, <laughs> from Hibs as well. He looks like he might be a player, but I think he probably needs another one to two years at, at Hibs. So yeah, Turnbull... The most well-rounded, uh, ready-to-go young Scottish talent, and yeah, already like I think Celtic, you know, in eighteen months, I can already envisage him being worth fifteen mil to Celtic, mm-hmm. fifteen twenty mil, and he played very limited opportunities for him in the in the Europa League, but when he played against Lille, he was very good, like the best player on the pitch, which obviously bodes well moving forward. And he's kind of had, he had to wait for his opportunity. Maybe he's moved to Celtic a season later than he'd like because he had to have surgery. Um, but only good things, mainly good things to say about him. A, a, a coach who has a real good track record of improving young players, say like Julian Stefan mm-hmm. uh, um, at Wren, I think could do absolute bits with him. So maybe it's going to work to his advantage as well that he's not got Neil Lennon at the helm, who's kind of like knows where to put good pieces. That was always his strength, Neil Lennon. Not necessarily improving players, but um, I look forward to seeing what a real world-class coach can coach into him. You mentioned there that his shot locations could do with a bit of work and sort of just watching a little bit of, of David Turnbull this season, you know, you do see him line them up from range quite quite often. You know, is that is that something which, which irks Celtic fans that perhaps you're squandering opportunities? Or is it the fact that, you know, you're creating so many chances in, in most games anyway that, you know, you can afford to, to, to allow a player of his mm. quality, because he does have quality from range, um, to, to actually pop them off? Yeah, I mean, if it was like every like one out of four shots was outside the box, I think you'd be, or even one and a half, two, I think you'd be understanding of that. But I think it's creeping up towards like 50, 60%. And that's not what mm-hmm. you want to see because that is just a guy who, instead of making that final ball, and he is very good, he's still very good at making the final ball, is, is perhaps choosing the wrong option um, on a lot of occasions. And, and Ryan Christie, I think maybe David Turnbull has gone a little bit overlooked because Ryan Christie, who's been touted for a move, you know, in January, this summer, to the likes of Arsenal, is taking like three quarters of his shots from outside the box. And I think that that is kind of, that shows that maybe it's not an, not necessarily these uh, individuals' issues, although they definitely have a like a penchant for it. 
But um, I doubt they would be their underlying numbers under someone like Brendan Rodgers, who was like a bit more structured mm -hmm. in his in the way his, his sides went about creating chances. You know, I can't see Neil Lennon like dividing the pitch into X amount of parts and being like, you don't move from here or you, you know, don't stand here when this player's here and only shoot from inside this area or do this. It's, it's Neil Lennon is always kind of like Martin and Neil, and like, let's just let the good, the good players kind of play and do what they want. And we don't want to bog them down with all this tactical information. And after a while, you're like, no, <laughs> no, I think, I think they probably need it. Um, so I think it's something that could be tweaked with ease. I don't think it's something Celtic fans are losing their heads over. Oh, Christ, there's enough at the club to, to you know, keep us preoccupied rather than like, individual shot locations. But um, but yeah, I think I think Ryan Christie will probably go, and then maybe it won't be so prevalent that we're taking like a third of our shots per ninety from outside the box. No, I can see that, and and I suppose it. It, it probably does irk you a little bit more when, when you realise that you've got a player of, you know, odds on Edouard's quality, in, more often than not in the box. He's the mm. player who, you know, it's not as if he's just a target man. You know, he can link exactly, play excellently. Yeah. And you think, well, if, you, if you're if you getting into these spaces, you want to be linking up. And, and perhaps, is who's to say that, that Turnbull couldn't... Um, couldn't boost his goals, boost mm. his goals and assists for the season by actually just combining a little bit more with French Eddie. Um, I think it's probably... Yeah, given that he's 23 and he's approaching that that upper level of the scouted football age range, um, it's probably a good idea to to discuss him on a pod. Um, I think, you know, the, the big question from a lot of people outside of Scottish football is, you know, is he going to move on? When is he going to move on? You know, how much are you going to make on that initial £9 million investment? You know, I think mm. in terms of value for money signings, he's a, you know, he's, he's, a, he's an enormous one. Um, you know, the, the fact that you are going to make such a, such a mint on, on him, but it is, it comes back to that higher question, you know, how are you going to replace a player who scored, God knows, 70 odd goals in two and a half, three seasons um, at, at the club? Hmm. He's pretty much got a goal contribution per start because people forget that he wasn't necessarily a starter when he first came. He was kind of like understudy to Dembele in many ways. And I remember Dembele being like, he was painfully shy when he first arrived in Glasgow and we had to really try and get him out of his shell. Um, and then there was kind of f yeah, flashes under under Rodgers, um, that that goal against Rangers where he he was brought on and we won 3-2 with a, with a man down, uh, I think was probably a seminal moment for him. Um, but yeah, just a classy guy, man. And I, unfortunately, I think PSG have got a 20 to 30% sell-on clause. So regardless of what we're selling for, they're getting a big old chunk of it. And we took a hit knowingly not selling him in like last summer or in January for upwards of 30 mil. I think it might have got around 35 to 40 mil at one point because we were so desperate to secure the 10. And obviously our lack of sort of contingency plan without him um, looked horrific. So we kept him, like I said, took that, took the um, devaluation. And I think probably 20 to 25 this summer, like with a year left on his contract, wants to go. Uh, Celtic need the money for the rebuild, not in the strongest negotiating position. Uh, which is unfortunate because I can see him, his value doubling as soon as he moves and has a, a good run of form. Um, and like you said, you, you intimated about his link-up play earlier. He's not he's not a one dynamic player. Um, uh, there's lots of things he can do very well. Uh, I think even if you put him in a side, he doesn't have to be the focal point, doesn't have to be the central mm. striker, probably can play on the, in that wide left channel um, in maybe like a four three three as well. Um, so yeah, he's going to be a real gift for someone, I think. Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. I mean, it it it, it comes down to the fact that you know a lot of a lot of teams and a lot of people in football probably do think you know well he, you know he's been fantastic in Scotland, but is that going to be scalable? Is you know where's the mm. scalability here? Is is he going to show that in a in a bigger league? And I mean, the consensus from us at Scouted is that absolutely you know wherever he goes, if he's if he's taken into a system which really really caters to his strengths and you know you don't it wouldn't even be necessary to do that because he's such a talented player anyway you know he's as you say he's moldable you know he's very he's versatile despite being he's versatile he's most he's mobile despite the fact that you know people might think of him as just this sharpshooter um i think he's mm. just a, a fantastic player um and yeah it'll be a shame to see him leave because 
I mean, first of all, one of the best songs on the terraces uh, in 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 years, I think, the the Stone Roses remake. Yeah, class. Um, I think that's that's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sing it because you know, I'm, yeah. you know I've, I've got a bit of a sore throat. Although not as there. good as not as good as the Scott Sinclair one. Go on, uh, go on, refresh can, my if memory. Can, if you can remember that, no, I've got. Now you mention a hoarse throat, so I'm struggling. <laughs> This is, you know, well past 6 p.m. I've been doing VOs and all sorts, John. I have a bit of decorum, mate. Um, <laughs> but I think if you want to go and check out the, um, the the Scott Sinclair one, that probably edges it for me. But yeah, like you said, great chant, great memories. Um, maybe then it was a shame not to see him in more uh, in more knockout round uh, knockout games. Sorry, in European football. Um, but hey ho, like again, we will go back to that Copenhagen game at home. Um, at Parkhead, uh, where we got knocked out in the round of 32 in the in the Europa League after beating Lazio home and away, uh, early signs that Neil Lennon was not not winging it, but not far off. Mm. We've gone years without using the right tools for the job. We've all been there. Some manscaping ruined by a shaving accident. That's why Manscaped has just released the new Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer which features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce those needless grooming accidents. It's even waterproof, so you can use it with ease in the shower. Complete with a USB charging stand, 90 minutes runtime, as well as 20% discount and free delivery when you use the code SCOUTED20. What are you waiting for? Make your testies your besties. Well, I mean, speaking of who would replace him, you know, you, you've, you've got something planned on on, a, on, on Jordan Larson. And, and of course, mm. this being a, a Celtic episode, the name Larson is going to ring in the ears of, <laughs> of anybody who's listening from a Celtic disposition. Um, you know, he's been at Helsingborg. Uh, he's currently at Spartak Moscow. Um, you know, you, as a type of player, you know, I think British audiences may not have come across him very often yeah. because, you know, Swede- Swedish football isn't isn't mega here. Russian football is very sort of closed off, I think, to many people. So, I mean, you, you've obviously seen a bit of him. You've watched him. You, you're assessing him. What, what's Jordan Larson like? Is he is it going to be a fairy tale, fairy tale transfer? <laughs> That's what I was trying to decide in this latest video I was doing. I was like, is this viable or are we all just kind of like hopeless football romantics? And just to establish, like, I don't mind if it's the latter. I don't <laughs> mind that at all. Um, for me, probably, he said a move to Celtic would be a dream move for him, which is always nice to hear. And it mm. does tug at the heartstrings. But I'm not sure if for me, to use his turn of phrase, if he would be a dream replacement for Odson Edouard. Because mm-hmm. I think stylistically, he's quite similar to an El Yanusi or maybe not maybe not a James Forrest, but the output might be similar from that right-hand side mm-hmm. if, he, if he replaced James Forrest, um, which might be something to think about. But yeah, like you said, I wouldn't hold it against uh, English, British audiences for not knowing much about him because he was playing Erste Divisie football three years ago. And to be fair to him, wherever he's gone, he's rose to the challenge and his numbers have gone up incrementally. Mm-hmm. There's no sign that he's hit his ceiling as of yet. He's the third top goal scorer in the Russian Premier League at current. And he's, he's kind of like a high... He's only just morphed into an out-and-out forward, really. Yeah. Last season, he kind of split his time 50-50 um, with like attacking midfield, right wing, being being one unit, uh, midfield uh, unit, and then centre forward. Uh, this season, he's, he's played 2,000 minutes up front. So it's clearly that uh, clearly Dominic Tedesco sees him as a centre forward, but still very creative. I think he's got his key passing numbers better than odds and Edwards. And Edwards are pretty solid at like 1.6 uh, per night, a Probably, probably lower than they have been in the last couple of seasons because of, you know Celtic have been so reliant on him um, in a goal scoring sense. Um, but yes, f- for me, Jordan Larson, I think he's probably going to cost ten to twelve mil if he moves. Spartak Moscow paid near enough four million for him from mm. Norcoping, which already makes me feel a little bit uneasy. Like they're going to want double, treble that given the player he's become. Right, I, I look at his expected goals and assist numbers. Uh, he's running a little bit hot. You know, he, he's got a bit of a rogue shot location as well. Um, there's like two shots against like, I don't know if it was like FC UFA or URA or some sort of acronym that were like from 40 yards. And I was like, what are you doing there, Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> but um, Why are you shooting? Why? Yeah. Just get it yeah, closer like, to the goal. <laughs> I was just having like little flashbacks to some of Ryan Christie's efforts. Um but yeah, I th- I think his his expected goals and assist numbers, sorry, uh, were par- were better than Marcus Rashford. So it's about 0.61 per night. So I think wherever he goes next, he's gonna be a goal threat. But like, is he 
a guy that leads a line? Perhaps not, because he's mostly played in a two mm. as well with Ezekiel Ponce and Sobolev, if I remember correctly. And those guys, um, they're pretty much at a well, I think Sobolev is pretty much at a goal a game as well. So clearly a side geared towards attack, towards kind of padding out those numbers to a degree. But yeah, I, I would maybe sign him as a, a right winger or, or you could potentially play him on the left as well. If, if you're going to play a, uh, if you're going to sign a big guy like I suggested, which was Roman Yaramchuk from Ghent, mm. uh, who's kind of a, sh- you know, brick shit house, <laughs> mobile, um, very clear reference point if we're going to play two wide men. Um, very good movement has sort of been a late bloomer, so might not cost. You know, he's 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 sort of coming into his own at around twenty six, so might not cost. You know, the earth. Um, so yeah, I don't want to shoot down the romantics, but it feels like Jordan Larson not like shouldn't be that high up our list. But I don't know what our list should look like because we don't have a manager, we don't have a sporting director, <laughs> so. It's, there's no continuity there, mate. We could well sign him. I don't know. All I'm hearing there is there's vacancies and you've been out there scouting for Celtic's replacement for Odson Edwards. So, I mean, <laughs> that's all I'm saying, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm intimating that there's perhaps there's potentially a role there that you need to go into Parkhead and just be like, look, right? I know his surname's Larson, but we can't, yeah. we can't do this just because of his name. This, this, it would be a fairy tale, but, you know, sentimentality aside, you know, we gotta, we've got to go for a Uremchuk. Um, or somebody yeah. like that. I mean, in fact, speaking of shooting from from stupid locations, I actually remember it might have been against Wolfsburg. Um, Yeremchuk scoring a goal last season in the Europa League for Ghent, which was a, from about 40 yards. And he just absolutely yeah. wellies it into the top <laughs> corner. Absolutely brilliant. And yeah, well, he's... they've been crap in the Europa as well the last mm. two seasons. So he's probably just shooting out of desperation. <laughs> yeah. isn't he? Yeah. He, he's someone that I could see, you know, the, the, the celebration where you, you kind of run to the advertising hoardings, you stand on top of it with both arms stretched and just the fans just crowd towards you. I could see that being a, a, a that yeah. type, type of sign and that type of play just loves the loves the drama. You might... Um... You might have read it as well, Soconomics, but there's a mm. little bit in that where um, they, they they speak about Ukrainian football as being chronically undervalued. And um, I thought that was quite interesting as well, because the only there's been some sort of weird transfer rumours um, uh, surrounding him in, like, in a, the last r- couple of weeks, strangely enough. But the only team I clocked that had been interested in him prior was, was Sporting Lisbon in, in, in January or Sporting CP. You can't have, not allowed to call him Sporting Lisbon, are you? Um, sporting CP. So, yeah, I don't even know if he's if he's going to, if a bidding war is going to emerge but, or if Celtic just went in with, you know, an uncharacteristic bid of like 40, 13, 14 mil, they'd, they'd just be able to get him because I don't think Ghent are getting European football next season either. They were 10th last time I checked. So, Something's got to give after a pandemic. Um, they're probably, you know, prepared to shed a star asset to, to balance the books. But, but yeah, I probably would go him over loss and make to, to round off your uh, your question. <laughs> it's 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 one thing that people are probably not going to want to hear. But you know, it's we're coming back to that level headedness. We like it. We like it. It's, <laughs> it's got all the trappings of a, of a sporting director. That's all I'm saying. No as long more. as it's part time in it, because I just I like kicking around and being a YouTuber. So. <laughs> Well, you know, you could be the first YouTuber slash sporting director. You know, there could be a, there could be a documentary about Celtic's new avant-garde young sporting director. Yeah. Who knows? Um, on, <laughs> on, on to sort of the the managerial situation you touched on there. Of course, you know we're we're having a laugh and a joke, but you know at, at, at present there isn't a I mean there isn't a permanent manager in charge. Um, you know, John mm. Kennedy's there. Um, who um, every time I see a manager who was born in the nineteen eighties, that makes me feel very old because I'm like. Jesus Christ, that's not that's not far off me, Jesus. Um, yeah, big one. But, you know, sort of playing sort of devil's advocate, you know, here, um, you know, you look at what Steven Gerrard has done at Rangers and you mm. think that, you know, we, we were talking about new ideas, talking about innovation, talking about somebody who's coming in, who's got uh, a, a reputation and, and a track record with developing young players as Gerrard did mm. with Liverpool's under-18s. You know, is is that what's needed at Celtic, a, a you know, taking a chance on a manager or, or do you, would you prefer mm. someone like a, an Eddie Howe or Julian Stefan? I think in England, we think that taking a chance sometimes means going for someone inexperienced mm. um, or or that young managers are inexperienced. When if you look at people like Thomas Tuchel, that's not necessarily the case, right? Like he'd done five years at Mainz before getting the Dortmund job. I think he was at Augsburg before that. Uh, and then he does a couple of years at PSG or whatever. Then he gets the Chelsea job. And that took all springs to mind because of the stark comparison between him and Lampard. And of course, Lampard has since been linked with Celtic. 
So I'm kind of just joining up the dots here um, and preparing a like, if you're suggesting Lampard, Joe, then I, it's a, it's a cold, hard disagree from me. No, absolutely um, not. Never, never. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so yeah, I mean, Eddie Howe, we, we would still characterise as a younger manager, but mm. I think people forget the, you know, people are lavishing praise on Chris Wilder. I think he's a very good manager and he's out there and he, he could be an interesting candidate for the Celtic uh, vacancy. But Eddie Howe did the exact same job, really, with Bournemouth. And and like Sheffield United, or Sheffield United like, like Bournemouth, if you want to go in a linear fashion, spent badly in a season where they wanted to kick on, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah, Eddie Howe's pedigree, I think, pretty unrivaled with, with relation to the rest of the shortlist. You know, when you see names on there like Jack Ross, um, Roy Keane, Gordon Strachan, I'm like, this is hellish for me. <laughs> like, Please, no. Um, and then Eddie Howe, I feel like, doesn't get the respect he deserves still. Um, because because Bournemouth were a bit naive in defence in the Premier League. Well, like, OK, but then, like, we're giving Leeds, the right people are giving Leeds tons of credit for going for it in games. Uh, you know, his, his, his philosophy might not have been quite as regimented or as immovable as, as, a, as a Bielsa, but... Yeah, he was a he was a manager who stuck to his guns, played attacking football, and kept Bournemouth in the Premier League for what four four seasons? Yeah, I think Five? it was four. Yeah, they came up in twenty sixteen. So yeah. yeah, finished ninth. Like they were absolute toilet when he took over. Um, had a really good record of recruiting talent from from lower down the English pyramid. Um, p- players that are still there now. Uh, so so yeah, I I think it's, it's a dream matchup. It would be a great sort of reparation for his. Um, for his career and I think we would get three years out of him and he, he you know he could add European football to his resume and then we begin this cycle again right but mm. you mentioned Stefan there I think he'd be an intriguing choice um I mean if because be, cause Celtics Academy just hasn't yielded the sort of talent it should have yeah um in the last five six years you know Kieran Tierney aside and there's a guy with a formidable record at, at Wren for for bringing through you know some players that have, have cost cost you know I mean, Usman Dembele I mean Rafinha um Camavinga of course uh, the, Camavinga the that's the big yeah. one I'm forgetting of course yeah players that are going to cost 100 mil plus in the future um so so yeah there's, there's some fascinating candidates it's there's so many decent managers out there right now that it has to be real balls up from Celtic to get to get a bad one you know like Spalletti's not in a job I know like guys like Allegri and um and Sarri are going to be too expensive they're not going to you know Celtic can't go near near them with the wages that they've had prior mm. but um even like Valverde why not like give him a give him a call see if he fancies getting back in the game I, I mean that's very juxtaposed to Barcelona, isn't it, Glasgow? But still, he might he might <laughs> fancy it. Um, no, I think that's probably a little bit unrealistic. But th- there is there is a, a good pool of managers out there now, mate. But I would still go for Eddie Howe, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting debate because, as you mentioned, there are so many good managers out of work who have been out of work for for a decent while. And, you know, you come to, you, you know, you discuss the, a club like Celtic, the, the prestige, the history that surrounds mm. it. You know, it is a club which is absolutely steeped in tradition. You know who wouldn't who wouldn't want to 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 you know the, the inner footballing romantic in all of us who wouldn't want to mm. come and resurrect the, the 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 club that has you know obviously been so close to doing the ten but just fell at the last hurdle and is now going to have to go through a rebuild. I think it does give one manager a real really unique opportunity to to rebuild a, a historic mm. club in their image and you know to. To, to, to really leave their mark on a club. And, and you know, somebody like Eddie Howe, I think, you know, the, the reparation for his career, as you said, that was, a, that was a point I completely didn't even think about, was that, you know, his, his stock has obviously fallen since Bournemouth's relegation. I think he's done quite well by staying out of the game for a season. Um, but yeah, again, a young yeah. manager. I mean, people scoffed records. at Rodgers, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. People, and, and look like what they happened. They scoffed at Rodgers when, yeah, post Liverpool, and now people are talking about him like you know he's the best British manager uh, in in the game, which he probably is. Um, so yeah, I think that trajectory, Rogers' trajectory, will embolden someone like how to make that step mm. uh, when that might not have been the case five years ago when we're or you know longer now when we're kicking around with the Ronnie Dylers and the and the Tony Mowbrays. Weirdly enough, I think Roy Keane was supposed to come in as manager and Ronnie Dyler was supposed to be his assistant. I think that was a weird one in the. Yeah, anyway, that's a different story. I'm going off at a tangent here. But there's, <laughs> if we don't get Eddie Howe, there's people like Lucien Favre who have got um, 
brilliant track records of developing young talent while while instilling a clear philosophy um, and and you know playing an attractive attacking brand of football, which is why I said on uh, one of our shows a few weeks ago I prefer Favre to someone like Mourinho. And people are like, oh, Favre, but hasn't he failed at kind of like Gladbach, Nice, Dortmund? Like, what has he won? I think he left Dortmund as the uh, highest points per game yeah. gathering, for want of a better phrase, uh, coach in, in their history. So there's another guy who like, because he looks a bit like a womble, <laughs> uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves. Um, so I think Celtic, yeah, it's going to it's gonna take something mightily stupid not to appoint a, someone progressive, but I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, it, it, yeah, a mighty balls up. Just, yeah, I, I am praying for just someone semi-competent to just, you know, yeah. come in and just, yeah, do that. I think that with the Fav shout, you know, he Borussia Dortmund in their current incarnation are always going to be a club who whose performance is juxtaposed uh, against Bayern Munich. And when Bayern Munich yeah. are sort of going from strength to strength and, you know, they're spending similar amounts of money as, as Bayern Dortmund. You know, you do you do think, well, that's that's going to make the manager's job a bit more untenable. Uh, yeah. So I, I think we've we've raised quite a few. I mean, I say we. You've raised some some good um, some good names there. I think it'll be uh, be interesting one to follow that over the uh, over this summer. Who would you go for? There's Peter Bosch as well, who I thought might be interesting, <sighs> but um, he's he's quite a gung ho. But uh, and he's actually a little bit older than I thought. Not that I'd hold that against him, but uh, who would you go for <laughs> from the outside looking in? I mean, you say Peter Bosch, and I think well, um, you know, I, I actually don't think that teams would get any of the ball um, in 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 the Scottish Premiership if if Peter Bosch came in at Celtic. <laughs> I genuinely think it would be ninety five to five percent possession um, in games. But I do like the Eddie Howe shout. Um, <sighs> I'm I'm trying to come up with a different left field pick here because I've said about yeah I've said about a hundred names so it's just yeah because I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to have to I don't want to have to agree with you but um, <laughs> I do think Eddie Howe's a good shout in terms of the yeah he, he, he you know follows the the Rogers mold I think and I think he did yeah. get a bit of stick you know yeah at times his Bournemouth team were naive as you said but you know this you're coming into Celtic and you've got the opportunity to, to, to make it, to make history. So yeah, mm. I, I'd, I'd probably go with Eddie Howe. Um, I'll probably get back to you on that one in, in private when I've had a little bit of a, a little bit of a think, a little bit of a, a chin scratcher, but um, yeah, that's, that, that's just about everything that, that I wanted to cover in this week's episode. You know, we do like to do a, a deep dive on, on specific clubs on, on the Scouted Football podcast, and and that one certainly delivered. I think you know we've covered the topics front to back, and you know the managerial discussion. You know, um, you know, uh, Odson Edward, the replacements for him, Christopher Ayer, David Turnbull, the rebuild, uh, and and sort of where it's gone wrong. Um, I've been yeah absolutely delighted to to have you on, Chris. Um, thank you very much for your time and your insight into the inner workings of Celtic and the inner workings of your brain. Uh, for those of us who, <laughs> who, who weren't privy to that beforehand, um, but for anybody who doesn't consume the, the great stuff that you put out on, on Football Daily, you know where can people find you on Twitter, YouTube, all that sort of thing. Yeah, come and uh, come and hit me up on Twitter. That's always the platform I think that the Football Daily Boys are most active on. My the rest of my social media game quite poor because I do spend most of my time ruminating over potential Celtic managers. Um, <laughs> now this has felt like therapy, mate. So thank you very much because I do tend to limit my like Celtic outbursts on Football Daily because it's like, come on, let's remain professional. <laughs> um, this isn't this isn't all about you. It's not all about Celtic. Uh, but this episode has been so. Yeah, fifty minutes of unadulterated Celtic chat. I've loved it. Um, yeah, Football Daily, Euro Football Daily on YouTube. I've also got my own channel where things are actually becoming quite geared towards Celtic because I do think it is an underserved uh, fan base on YouTube, etc. Uh, massive appetite for Scottish football online, and not not a lot of people deliver all that well i mean even the sbfl's official channel don't have commentary on the highlights come on <laughs> um so yeah just any any of those mate fantastic well if, if anybody wants to, to check out the stuff that, that chris does then then do do explore that I, I can't recommend it enough i watched that that celtic video on your on your channel and that was kind of a bit of inspiration for this episode and i thought yeah you know that's the kind of energy we need on the scattered football podcast sometimes <laughs> nice to break it up you know we have the analytical episodes and whatnot and to be fair there's been a fair share of analysis today but um yeah we like to we like to add add a little 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 smidgen a little smattering of 
personality in there as well. But yeah, thank you very much for, for tuning in, everyone. Um, really hope you've, you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, and do leave us a comment, leave us, you know, leave us some feedback, tweet us on, on, on Twitter or, or leave us some, uh, some feedback on Instagram or anything like that. Let us know what you've, you've thought of this episode. But anyway, I've been Joe Donahue. This has been the Scouted Football Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. Stay safe. Take care. Bye for now. Get 20% off and free delivery with the code SCOUTED20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free delivery at manscaped.com. Use code SCOUTED20. Your balls will thank you. Thank you.